What happened here, November 11, 1975? In the U.S. state of Arizona, in the mountains south of Heber, is where the most widely documented, defended, and contested alien abduction in the world occurred. It was from this phone booth on Arizona Highway 60 where reported alien abductee Travis Walton returned to call his family just after midnight on November 11, 1975. 22-year-old Travis Walton, his manager Mike Rogers, and five other men worked to thin trees in the Sitgreve Apache National Forest about 15 miles south of Heber, Arizona, near Turkey Springs. They worked until dark in an effort to meet their contract deadline of November 10. Around 6 p.m. as the sun set behind the mountains, Mike Rogers returned to the group after having flagged the area of their tree thinning operation. The men loaded their equipment into the work truck and piled in. Mike Rogers drove south on the rough logging road, bouncing over the water bars toward the better maintained rim road when the men's attention was drawn to a light in the clearing about 90 feet behind a slash pile they had stacked earlier in the day, possibly a hunter's campfire. Then, through the pine trees, suddenly appeared a bright gold-colored glow 20 feet above the ground. John called for Mike to stop the truck, to which he did and turned it off. Travis watched from the front passenger seat. Curious, and against his co-worker's commands to stay in the truck, Travis walked toward the light. As he stood under the aircraft, he sensed danger and stepped away, but it was too late. A blue-green beam emitted from the craft and struck Mr. Walton in the upper torso. The crew reported it tossed him to the ground. It was here he may have injured his right arm. Travis indicated later that he may have been fed intravenously. In fear, Mike Rogers and the others took off in the truck about a thousand feet down the road before stopping. They watched the light behind them rising from the forest and quickly disappear as it sped away to the east. Rogers, with the ship having left and themselves having left their co-worker in the dark forest in sub-freezing temperatures, turned the truck around and returned to check on Travis. Some of the crew, including Steve Pierce, didn't believe they were in the same spot, but Rogers was the driver, the supervisor, and more familiar with the area than any of them, so they didn't question the location of the time. They called out for Travis and searched the area. After 15 minutes and no answer and no trace of Travis, they hurried back to the truck and into town. Mike drove them to Heber, where Ken Peterson called the police. Deputy Sheriff Chuck Ellison, after speaking with them and seeing their concern, relayed the story to his supervisor, Sheriff Marlon Gillespie. Mike Rogers, Alan Dallas, and Peterson led him and the deputies to the area where Mike says they saw the aircraft. After finding no signs of Travis and temperatures dropping to single digits, Sheriff Gillespie, weary of their statements, suggested if the young men were perpetrating a hoax, they would pay the bill. The working theory of law enforcement was Travis was killed and the abduction story was a cover-up. Being murder suspects, it was in everyone's best interest that Travis be found. So the next day, when Dwayne Walton and Mike Rogers realized there were no police at the abduction site, they angrily let law enforcement know they should be out searching. And, at the time, it turned out to be the largest missing person search in Arizona. Scent dogs, ATVs, horses, and helicopters were added to the search. After several days, they still found no traces of Travis in the freezing temperatures. They began to believe he was dead and other Bear and small surrounding towns suspected murder. Meanwhile, Travis woke on a table in a spaceship surrounded by short aliens with big brown eyes and orange jumpsuits, and even some humans who he tried and failed to flee. He was never spoken to, but they managed to coax him back to a table where they placed a mask on his face and put him to sleep. Newspapers and television stations were running stories and reporting on the abduction while authorities searched and tried to sort out the situation with Travis's family. Travis's family, friends, and townspeople alerted UFO organizations and reported the incident and rumors. UFOlogists searched the site and reported higher than normal Geiger counter readings, which lended more support to the young men's accounts. In an interview at the time, Dwayne says Travis isn't missing. Skeptics claim this proves he knows where Travis was hiding, but he could have meant Travis is not missing as he believed he's on a spaceship. On the morning of November 10, 1975, while the world waited, the work crew, being accused of murder, each took lie detector tests administered by Cy Gilson of the Department of Public Safety. Three questions were related to the harm they may have caused Travis, as this was the concern of law enforcement. The fourth question asked them explicitly if they believed they saw a UFO. All passed except Alan Dallas, whose test came back inconclusive, leading the test administrator, Cy Gilson, 
to conclude that they did not harm Travis and they believe they saw a UFO. But without Travis, murder would still be on the minds of law enforcement. Late that same night of November 10, 1975, in this area between one mile and a quarter mile west of Heber, in a temperature around 20 degrees, Travis woke up on Highway 260 in the same work clothes as the night he disappeared. As he looked up, a bright glow rose above him, disappeared, and left him in the dark. He looked up to see the lights of Heber and ran toward them as the clock passed midnight. He ran to the service station, an Exxon at the time, referred to by his stepbrother Ralph Anderson as the Amico station in Heber, where he used the phone at this booth in the early morning of November 11, 1975, to contact the only family member near Heber with a house phone, his sister, 30 miles away in Snowflake. He spoke to her disbelieving husband, Grant Neff, who hung up on him, believing he was a prankster. Travis made a second call. Grant handed the phone to Travis's older brother, Dwayne, who was up from Phoenix during the search, heard his brother, terrified and desperate. Travis waited at the phone booth for his brother, Dwayne, and brother-in-law, Grant. They drove to the phone booth to find Travis crouched on the floor, disturbed and mumbling. They took him back to his sister's to clean up. Travis, being in the same work clothes and returning at night to a similar temperature as when he went missing, believed he had only been away for a few hours. He had not realized five days had passed, though he had five days growth of facial hair and according to him, lost 10 to 12 pounds, much due to dehydration. Later that morning, they left from Snowflake to Phoenix to meet with Bill Spaulding of Ground Saucer Watch and see a doctor, as well as to avoid reporters. They did notify the sheriff's office to let Gillespie know Travis had been unharmed. After meeting with Mr. Spaulding, Dwayne and him had a quick falling out. Dwayne returned Travis to Snowflake. Dwayne was then reached by another organization, Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, or APRO. After some hesitation, he came to trust them and agreed to meet back in Phoenix. Later on November 11, APRO was contacted by the National Enquirer, who sent several parties to investigate, including Jeff Wells. Once word traveled that Travis was found, people were split on whether he had been abducted or it was a hoax. Since Travis was not in Heber and recommended to not face the press to answer questions, residents, the press, UFO organizations, enthusiasts, and law enforcement began to speculate on the events that carry on to this day. Many defend Travis enthusiastically, but some motives are provided as to why the story is not true. The motives have been met with decades of plausible challenges from the UFO community the witnesses and Travis. One theory is that Mike Rogers wanted out of the Forest Service contract because they were going to miss their November 10 deadline and lose 10% of the contract payment unless affected by an act of God event. Another theory was Travis and Mike pranked the work crew and it spun out of control, the idea coming after watching an alien abduction movie on television. The movie recalls the Betty and Barney Hill abduction on September 19, 1961 in the U.S. state of New Hampshire. When the incident was leaked in 1965, it became the most publicized alien abduction event in the world. The made-for-TV movie, called The UFO Incident, starring James Earl Jones, aired at 9 p.m. on October 20, 1975, only 16 days before the reported abduction of Travis Walton. A third theory is they were capitalizing on an open offer from the National Enquirer that paid $100,000 for a proven account of an alien abduction. That is over a half million dollars today. But the National Enquirer contacted APRO, who had to convince the Waltons to trust them with their experts and doctors before the Waltons met with them. In their return trip to Phoenix on November 12, Travis's brother Dwayne did meet with the National Enquirer, who paid for he and Travis to hide in a luxury hotel from other reporters and Heber Sheriff Gillespie for five days as they paid for hypnosis, psychologists, and a lie detector test. Gillespie himself was demanding Travis return to Heber for a lie detector test. The National Enquirer's Jeff Wells stated that on November 15, 1975, that John J. McCarthy, who Wells said is the most experienced polygraph examiner in Arizona, administered a polygraph test on Travis Walton. McCarthy concluded that Travis failed miserably. Dwayne was angered by the result and claimed the test was poorly administered as embarrassing questions were being asked of Travis that were unrelated to the events between November 5 and November 10. Psychiatrists were brought in to hypnotize and analyze Travis, while some including Professor James Harder, believed what Travis Walton shared under hypnosis, National Enquirer reporter Jeff Wells was among those who did not. Wells wrote a 16-page memorandum meant to discredit the story. When it was finally published by the National Enquirer on December 16, 1975, 
It was edited with Professor Harder's assessment that he was convinced of the abduction. The fact that five of the six crew members passed their lie detector test as performed by Cy Gilson was featured in the article headline, but Travis Walton's failed test by McCarthy was not known until months later on June 20, 1976, when Philip Klass, chairman of PSYCOP's UFO subcommittee, concluded after his investigation that the incident was a hoax and revealed Travis failed his first polygraph. Walton claims this was done too soon and under too much stress as he has since passed other polygraph tests, including a more detailed examination in February 1993 by the polygrapher of the original witnesses, Cy Gilson. However, in 2008, Mr. Walton was a guest on the Fox game show Moment of Truth, where the polygraph examiner asked him if he was abducted by aliens. Travis failed the question. He wrote a public rebuttal to this test as he often does to his skeptics. Those that believe him ask him two hard to refute questions. How did five of six crew members pass a polygraph test with one being inconclusive only days after the event? They have since passed several more and after four decades, none of the crew members have recanted their stories. One challenge is the accuracy of the polygraph tests. Another answer could be that the crew members believe what they saw to be a spaceship, but it doesn't mean it wasn't actually something else, something worldly that night they mistook for a spaceship. Recently, the abduction has come under more scrutiny, as Mike Rogers was recorded by producer Ryan Gordon of Orion Adventures, who asked, you and Travis together hoax this? To which Mike responds, Travis's brother Dwayne helped him. Mike has retracted his statement, implying it was manipulated. And he does not explicitly say it was a hoax, but does indicate Travis's actions appeared staged, though he also maintains what he saw looked like a real spaceship. Ryan Gordon holds the opinion that the lights from the spaceship are actually from the Gentry Fire Tower next to the Gentry Campground, which could explain some of the witnesses believing Mike returned to a different spot when searching for Travis. Not long after Mr. Rogers' statement, Witness Steve Pierce told Charlie Weiser that he may have been fooled into believing it all these years, and that his uncles actually took him to the Gentry Tower in the daytime during the November 1975 search to suggest it was the tower lit up at night, the blue light being a spotlight. Steve is among those that admits he never thought from the first day they returned to look for Travis that they had returned to the actual abduction site. Witnesses Alan Dallas and Dwayne Smith have passed away, either believing they saw a UFO for having taken to their grave the greatest alien encounter hoax the world has known. And the rest of the crew, whether we believe them or they believe what they experienced to be an alien craft and an abduction of Travis Walton, had Mr. Walton not returned, they could have been charged with murder, or at the least, been under suspicion their entire lives, if not for what happened here on November 11, 1975.